A graduate student at the University of North Carolina is arrested after allegedly gunning down an associate professor. Former U.S. Marshal Art Roderick comes on to discuss the case and what may be happening behind the scenes. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law & Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. Let's head over to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill as there was a campus-wide lockdown on Monday afternoon after a faculty member was shot and killed just two weeks into the new school year. Think about that. UNC assistant professor and researcher Dr. Zi Zhan was shot and killed inside of a campus classroom building. And this sparked absolute chaos among students and faculty with a campus-wide lockdown while law enforcement had been searching for the shooter. The shelter-in-place alert was issued shortly after 1 p.m. The suspected shooter was arrested around 2.38 p.m. They were able to locate and arrest 34-year-old graduate student Tai Lei Chi in an off-campus residential neighborhood not too far from the scene of the crime. And the end of the lockdown and the all-clear alert was sent at around 4.14 p.m. So that was very quick work by law enforcement to resolve this situation. Now the question is, who is this suspected shooter? Who is Tai Lei Chi. Well, he is originally from China, where he earned his bachelor's degree in physics from Wuhan University in 2015. He worked as a researcher at Zhushou Advanced Materials Research Institute and then a research assistant at the Southern University of Science and Technology in China before eventually coming to America. And this is where he then earned his master's from Louisiana State University in December of 2021. So now Chi is studying for his PhD at UNC. And then at the beginning of this new school year, he allegedly shoots and kills John. Now, police are still unclear about Chi's motive, but what does seem to be clear is that Chi knew John. You see, Zizi Jean was an associate professor in the Department of Physical Sciences, but he also led a physics research group. And guess who joined that group last year? Yep, Tai Lei Chi. Actually, just a few months earlier, Chi is eerily seen in a photograph with John, who was his academic advisor. So Tai Lei Chi was arrested on Monday, where he apparently didn't resist being arrested. He was ultimately charged on Tuesday with first-degree murder and possession of a weapon on educational property, faces the possibility of life in prison, and it is also possible he could face additional charges. His next court appearance is scheduled for September 18th, but there's still a lot of questions surrounding this case, including the fact that the weapon that was used in this shooting has not been found. So I want to bring in right now former U.S. Marshal Art Roderick to give some insight. Art's career in local and federal law enforcement spans almost 40 years. He served 25 of those years in the U.S. Marshal's office. And prior to that, he was a police officer in Massachusetts. He served in the U.S. Army as a military policeman, and he is with us right now. Art, so good to see you. Thanks for coming on to Sidebar to talk about the case. No, thanks for having me on. So this suspected shooter, he's charged with uh, Zi Zhan's murder. Obviously, he's innocent until proven guilty. But just from taking a look at everything that we know so far in the case, what do you make of it? Well, you know, I've, I've probably covered over 40, probably close to 60 of these cases over the, over the past decade uh, involving school shootings or active shooters. Um, this particular case seems to be a lot more targeted than what we've seen in the past, uh, where usually we will we'll have an active shooter at a school and he indiscriminately goes around and, and starts shooting people. So, again, we don't know what the motive is. Uh, I, I agree with you that it appears targeted. I want to move to something that seems maybe going to give us an indication of something. We know a digital footprint is very important in these criminal investigations, and the suspected shooter, he had this Twitter account, or appeared to have this Twitter account. It's now been suspended, and he often tweeted complaining about his frustrations regarding UNC Chapel Hill's campus and their people. He tweeted once, quote, both the group of people to say I am lazy and that to prove me working hard instead of telling me that are trying to consume my privacy, I judge their motivation is only to tell my PI, uh, I think that's a principal investigator, then control me by tale telling. And he also tweeted, just have a talk with my PI and get his promise. He should have more experience to handle with these girls and tattletales. Now, it's not clear if PI means Zizi Jean, but th I, I mean, those are social media posts that may give you insight into what he was thinking. What do you make of that? 
Yeah, I mean, there was. Uh, I've also read reports about possible bullying um, that was directed towards him. So, you know, this could all be part of sort of what we generally lump these lump these into sort of a domestic situation where there was something going on between him and this professor, the shooter and the professor. Um, and it does to me, because nobody else was shot or killed in the general area there, that this was very targeted. And I have seen reports that there was some conflict going on within that research group uh, where the professor hadn't showed up or hadn't contacted them recently. And they had some major project too. Uh, so it does appear uh, to be quite a bit different than the Dollar General shooting, which just occurred two days prior down in Jacksonville. It was racially motivated. So um, again, they've got a lot of work to do. Uh, this particular individual shooter is alive, so they should be able to get quite a bit of information from him. And it looks like those weapons were purchased legally. You would think that as a, a non-U.S. citizen, you would not be able to purchase a firearm, but you can in this country as long as you have a, a ICE-generated alien number or a green card or work visa, you are able to purchase a weapon. I haven't seen the paperwork, but I'm assuming that's exactly what the sheriff meant when he said that the, that the weapons were legally purchased. Um, it's always nice to get the murder weapon because it sort of wraps the whole case up in a bow. But to me, when when this case initially broke, for them to come out with a photograph the way they did so quickly, um, it was obvious that this individual was known um, uh, to uh, not only the campus, but to law enforcement. And as we find out now, he was part of a research group there at the campus. A lot of things to break down there. First, you yeah. imagine that they're going to interview the other members of the research group? Uh, absolutely. And, you know, you talked earlier about the digital footprint. That is key in a lot of these uh, shooting situations. And they, we're already getting indications that there might be a motive here in the background due to bullying and some tension within that particular research group. So uh, it is, I mean, he's going to be the key part of this whole investigation to come up with the absolute motive of why he did this. You, you, it's interesting you say that because the UNC uh, at Chapel Hill uh, chief of police, Brian James, he came out and said to actually have the suspect in custody, it gives us an opportunity to either figure out the why and even the how and also helps us to uncover a motive and really just why this happened today, which we don't have in a lot of these shooting cases. The this shooter is either takes their own life or they're gunned down. Um, how do you get information from the suspect? Uh, I mean, obviously, he's probably lawyered up at this point in time, but there's, there's going to be a lot of negotiation back and forth. I, not necessarily negotiation, but talks between um, law enforcement and, and the suspect and the attorney and his attorney uh, to figure out how they can have some give and take here. Uh, it's unusual they haven't found the weapon yet. I know there was a little bit of time between a couple hours, three hours between the time that he committed the crime and the actual arrest. So he had plenty of time to get rid of that weapon. Hopefully he'll go ahead and and uh, let law enforcement know exactly where that weapon is. But it could be a bargaining chip for him uh, as he continues through uh, the criminal justice process. They've impounded his car. They're saying they're going to be looking for evidence there. What do you think they're looking for? Uh, probably more weapons, more ammunition. You know, in a lot of these cases, it's from a criminal justice law enforcement perspective, uh, you know, we go ahead and we research every one of these shootings. And there's been several studies that have come out over the past couple of years, one by Secret Service a couple of years ago. And then about a year after the Las Vegas Music Festival shooting, the FBI did a really in-depth uh, active shooter report that came up with a lot of a lot of statistics about the average age, what motivations there are uh, behind a lot of these shootings. And, um, uh, you know, this again will be studied. Uh, this particular shooting will be studied and it will be compared to the other ones that we've had uh, recently and in the past. So uh, it's important that we gather all the information we can on these cases because there's two things that law enforcement likes to do. It's, it's prevention and reaction. And prevention is is sort of what happened at the at the historically black university down in Jacksonville a couple of days before this shooting, when a school resource officer took the initiative to go after the shooter 
and actually get his license plate. And you hear a lot of these schools around the country now are, are being uh, made not to be soft locations. So whether all the doors are locked or they have other barriers inside these schools after schools start up, that's the prevention side. The, the reaction side, obviously, is what, what I did a lot over at Homeland Security in performing first responder training for law enforcement, for fire, uh, for EMS stuff. So um, it is it is become quite a, 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 you know, service in this country right now, looking at both the prevention and the reaction side of what you're doing in the active shooter arena. Unfortunately, we've come to a stage in our society where we're actually naming these different types of ways different types of ways that human beings are killing other human beings. It it seemed to me that law enforcement and the campus acted incredibly quickly. We had, we had this campus lockdown. You, people might say, well, it took two hours to find him. I I think that was relatively quick considering what was happening in the situation. We weren't even sure when it was first going down, if there was a fatality um, and we were just trying to make sense of what it was, but seeing that they were able to capture him, detain him, uh, you know, alert the student body immediately to what was happening, having a shelter in place. Um, I thought law enforcement and the campus did incredible work there. Do you feel the same way? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that, that's usually the case in 99% of the cases. I mean, we do hear about, um, you know, places like Stoneman Douglas School, uh, Parkland High School, where law enforcement response wasn't that great. You look at Evaldi, you know, where Law enforcement response wasn't that great, but in, you know, the overwhelming 99% of these cases, law enforcement is there in a short period of time. And I'll tell you that usually when the active shooter is not on the scene by the time law enforcement arrives within those couple of minutes, to me, that that shows me that there was, this is a targeted shooting. Mm. This is a targeted shooting. And the individual did what he had to do and got the hell out of there, as opposed to somebody that's just there randomly killing, um, yeah. you know, innocent people. Uh, so this this also tends uh, gets me to believe that this this was very targeted uh, in the, in his response to whatever was happening within that research. Art, before I let you go, I want to ask you about this: the fact that he is not a U.S. citizen, originally from China, studying in the U.S., allegedly commits murder on U.S. soil. How does that affect whether, I don't mean not to get too political and geopolitical here, but will China respond to this in any way? Is there any way that that affects his legal case and his punishment if he's ultimately convicted or takes it uh, or pleads guilty? It won't affect the legal case from the criminal justice process perspective, but there are certain guidelines that we have here in the U.S. and other foreign countries have where the consulate the embassy will be notified that one of their citizens is, is in custody and we allow visitation from that particular embassy or consulate to come and make sure that the, the individual is okay and that they can actually let the family know they've visited this particular individual right. and let his family know back in China that everything is you know, as fine as could be in this particular situation. You know, we talk about the fact that this wasn't a um, a mass shooting and multiple people weren't killed, and thank goodness. But at the end of the day, this is incredibly sad because there was a life lost. Um, yes. North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper released a statement saying he's going to pledge all state resources to help in this investigation. UNC Chancellor Kevin Guskowitz remembered Xi Zhijian as a beloved colleague, mentor, and father of two. Art Roderick, thank you so much for taking the time and breaking down what may be happening behind the scenes and what we can expect moving forward. Thank you so much, sir. No, thank you. And that's all we have for you here on Sidebar, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. I'll speak to you next time. Mm